This interview is a deep dive, literally, into the world of marine permaculture and seaweed and why the Regen Ag movement shouldn't stop at the shoreline, but continues into our seas and oceans. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture. Today I'm joined by Brian von Herzen, Executive Director of the Climate Foundation and the original founder of the Marine Permaculture Movement. I'm very interested to dive deeper into something we haven't discussed too much, the seas, the connection from the seas to the soils. Welcome, Brian. Oh, thank you. Greetings, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. And to start with a personal question, what brings you to this space? What brings you to seaweed, soils, region ag, um, of all the other research topics or all the other topics you could have uh, spent your life on? Well, nearly two decades ago, we were doing some expeditions across Greenland in a small plane, and we noticed uh, the surface of Greenland was melting. And it was a very small melt ponds to begin with, but each year that we crossed, the size of the melt ponds were increasing, doubling in size. After a couple of years, they were calling them melt lakes. And then by 2012, 97% of the surface of Greenland melted. And we realized even in the early 2000s that we had to do something sustainable to try to address this uh, exponential increase in melting. And that led me to do a sabbatical in Woods Hole in studying algae biology and carbon biogeochemistry. And then beyond that, to really consider how can we enlist life to help us rebalance carbon in our seas and in our soils. And you work on a lot of different topics. I'm definitely going to link your website and a lot of your talks below. But in this case, this conversation, I would like to focus on the finance side of things, the investor side of things, because I know a lot of listeners will be very excited um, after, or I hope at least, after this interview. Um, so I hope that we can give them some direction and some focus. So I would like to ask a question on, basically you're mentioning the connection between the mountains and the sea. And I think it's something we focus a lot on the soil and on the land side of things. Why is that connection between the mountains and the sea so important? The mountains help the sea and the sea helps the mountains, or I should say the soils. So I just finished giving a talk here in Morocco where I was visiting with the government. And we met with some of the agriculture and some of the aquaculture groups here and agencies. And it was very interesting because I spoke about my home state of California where we've studied the kelp forests. And, you know, there's a shifting baseline. No one has a living memory of the kelp forests that were off the coast of California in the mid 1800s. But we went back and did the research to find the original U.S. geodetic survey maps from 1850s, 1860s, 1880s, which showed a river of a kelp a kilometer wide extending from Point Concepcion hundreds of kilometers all the way past the border with Mexico. And this was a continuous river of kelp between 10 and 25 meters depth that was covering the coastline. And it was this incredible bounty of nature. Now, what happened was in the early 1900s, we had development of farming, uh, urbanization, but primarily the loss of soil and runoff that went into the sea because of standard farming practices. And that was exacerbated later. And between the silt and the nutrients, the visibility in the water dropped precipitously. 
And this actually choked off the juvenile kelp from growing from a depth of 25 meters to the surface. If they don't have enough sunlight, they can't grow all the way to the surface. If they can't grow, they don't survive. And so we lost the deep kelps and we lost some of the middle kelps. And so now we only have a small remnant of the forest that once was. And so this is how our farming practices can affect our, the sea and the sea clarity. And so if we do less runoff and more regenerative farming, we can actually have a much clearer ocean. And then conversely, the seaweeds have this incredible input, a catalytic input almost, on the growth of crops, both as a soil amendment and also as a seaweed foliar biostimulant. And in several other ways, for example, as a feed supplement for ruminant livestock, it can cut most of the methane of the enteric emissions of ruminant livestock. So there's so many ways that the sea gives back to the farm and gives back to the soil. And I think it's a, a full circle, a circular value chain, if you will. And I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Uh, let's start with, um, because I've seen and, and heard a number of farmers talk about seaweed on their farm. So they basically bring seaweed which has been grown at the sea, obviously, to their farm as a, uh, as a soil amendment, as you mentioned. Um, is that happening at scale? And if not, what would be necessary to really kickstart that part of the industry, which I think to farmers looks very interesting because it is that full circle of maybe some of the old runoff that was captured by the seaweed and now no longer has runoff because they're doing regenerative farming, but they still need some of those input back basically to, to kickstart their system. Is that something you see on a small scale? And, and if so, what would be necessary to really scale that up? There is small scale incorporation of kelp and seaweeds off the coast of California, for example, and to some extent utilized in Australia permaculture as well, where the kelps and the seaweeds provide micronutrients. They provide polysaccharides, growth stimulants, um, the natural glibarillins and auxins and cytokines that help plants grow, exist in seaweed. And so scientists and researchers have had a hard time isolating a single compound that does it. There seems to be a synergy between polysaccharides, beneficial proteins, plant growth regulation, and micronutrients that together have a transformative effect on the production in the soil. We've seen uh, peer-reviewed literature citing to 11% increase in rice, 20% increase in vegetables, 40% increase in eggplants, and one or two published studies showing 56% increase in yields on soybeans. And this is using seaweed foliar biostimulants. Now, that's a very small application rate. It's only a few liters per acre or maybe four liters per hectare. But even at these very low rates, there are significant yield increases in agriculture. Then furthermore, there's a the notion of a soil amendment, the mulch, the compost, and that would be a larger application of solid seaweeds. And as long as you can manage, you know, at these very small levels, the, the uh, salinity is not a factor and you can track it at the larger levels as well. And I think those are key areas. But, you know, in terms of scale today, Ascophyllum rockweed is uh, harvested from Maine, from Canada, from Iceland, even parts of Europe, and has been used in relatively large quantity in I would call them seaweed soil amendments and, and whatnot that are used a fair amount in commercial and uh, personal farms today. So that's a good starting point. But, you know, this northern seaweed has different effects than the tropical red seaweeds and the tropical brown seaweeds and even some of the kelps. So I think that there are different types of seaweed and the, co the right combination of seaweed for particular plants is going to be a key opportunity to develop in the months and years ahead. So you would see a lot of opportunity in basically mixing and trying to find the right recipe for the right type of, type of crop or cropland basically to mix or to connect them better. Yes, in particular, what we're noticing is that seaweed does a fantastic job of increasing the stress resistance of the plants. And that includes resistance to heat, resistance to drought, and resistance to disease. And, you know, all crops have some amount of stress, but when we get into a global warming situation, the amount of heat stress and the amount of drought becomes severe. And some, and there, the seaweeds have been able to confer stress resistance to these crops very substantially. It's one of the best approaches. And we're noticing that the tropical red and the tropical brown seaweeds are particularly effective at some of these stress resistance increases. And does it change the flavor? 
Uh, no, not at all. I mean, but I also mean, does it improve it maybe? Or Well, that's a good question. So if you look at the micronutrient levels of our vegetables over the last few decades, we've lost most of the micronutrients of the vegetables due to this leaching. And, you know, seaweeds have every element in nature and some abundance in their composition. So when you put the seaweed back into the soil and, uh, and even at these very small quantities, you're getting these micronutrients that can help to actually regenerate the micronutrient value of our vegetables. So I think there is an enormous value there. And I would, you know, we like to use seaweed for food, feed, and fertilizer. And I think, yes, it's great for the soil and, and uh, micronutrients. And, and that part was fine. And then uh, we're also seeing amazing superfood properties of eating small amounts of seaweed every day. I mean, every time I go surfing, I'm eating seaweed when I'm out there. You know, so it's clean water. And I've got some kelp or some seaweed that are is rooted to the rocks out there. There's 14,000 species to try and nearly all of them uh, edible. And most of my knowledge, in fact, almost all of them are non-toxic. And I think that's a, let's say the nutrient density of food and, and the connection to healthy soil or something that comes back in these podcasts a lot of times. And I think it's potentially one of the keys to unlock the sector and to really get the consumer or at least the, the food sector more and more interested in healthy soils. That is so true. I think, you know, seaweed as a nutraceutical is has been absolutely amazing. I just uh, finished meeting with some researchers in Europe that have studied the effects of seaweed for many diseases. One study uh, I saw in the U.S. that was about Asia showed, of course, on a countrywide basis, about seven times less breast cancer in countries like Thailand and Japan. And furthermore, in a mouse model for breast cancer, they observed 10 to 20 times lower tumor incidence in breast cancer when a small amount of seaweed was added to the water supply of these mice. And that was uh, very substantial because otherwise the diets were identical. And so they were able to reproduce this cancer effectiveness. The seaweed was very surprising. The, the European studies focused on Alzheimer's models for for mice, and they had these mouse models for Alzheimer's, and these were elderly mice, and you know we're not able in this advanced stage of, of the disease, we're unable to remember how to get through a maze. But when they added a moderate amount of seaweed to the water supply for these mice, they actually recovered the ability of short-term memory to understand how to get through the maze. And so these neuroprotective benefits and other health benefits of seaweed have been amazing to read about in the peer-reviewed literature. I think we can, I mean, this is absolutely fascinating. We can probably spend two hours just as food or, or seaweed as medicine. But if it's, if the, the advantages, and, and many of these actually have been clear for a while, a lot of this research is coming out now, but like the ecosystem services, the potential of cleaning up a lot of the leaching, et cetera, has been known for quite a while, maybe not to the extent and also not to the extent of how much seaweed there actually was, or in this case, the case is the kelp forest in, in California. I think we all suffer from that. Nobody can imagine anymore how full the Mediterranean was with life as it is. We, nobody has seen it in their lifetime. Um, wh what is stopping this gigantic, let's say, regeneration of our, of just even just our coastal areas, if the advantages and the returns in all different aspects, not just financial, are so enormous? What do you see as the biggest barriers? Well, first of all, there's a nutrient barrier, and that's what we studied about the ecosystems. If we go back to the Permian extinction 250 million years ago, we find that the development of that Permian extinction was associated with warming and stratification of the oceans. And as the oceans warm, 93% of global warming is going into the oceans. We create this stratified layer of water, and that forms a barrier to the upwelling that provides nutrients to algae. And so the normal amount of offshore winds would normally bring the water up to the surface and cause the overturning circulation and enable the seaweed to grow. And that gets shut down when the ocean gets too warm. And so we saw that in the Permian extinction where 96% of all marine life went extinct. And according to the recent studies, we've already lost 2% of the oxygen in the ocean. And so we're 2% of the way towards the Permian extinction. And the question is, can we stop it and reverse it one kelp forest at a time using this kind of overturning principle? 
And, you know, this would apply from the Mediterranean to the tropical oceans, even the subtropics. So basically what you're saying is there's this layer of water in the oceans or in the seas, which is blocking the nutrient rich um, uh, sub layer to come up, basically. And that's what you're working on in marine permaculture, right? To reverse that. We are. We look to, you know, the tropics to use marine solar energy, also waves in the ocean and even wind energy in the higher latitudes to restore overturning circulation. We have pipes that come up from below the thermocline. We can provide up to a million cubic meters of seawater per day to a larger seaweed permaculture and effectively enable the irrigation 12 months a year of a seaweed forest and enable it to grow at least as much as it did under natural conditions pre-industrially. Yeah, so you're building these big pumps, as I'm imagining them, and I've seen them on videos, to basically pump up this water or bring up this water from underneath this blockage. You've been doing that at different places. What are the results? How fast is this? What, what is the impact also beyond just the area around the pump? Well, the first places we tested were in Hawaii. And then from there, we went on and uh, won the Blue Economy Challenge from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And there, uh, they provided us with resources needed to do a small test system in Indonesia. And in Indonesia, we found that with irrigation, the seaweeds were able to grow more than 2% per day, whereas uh, without the irrigation, it was less than 2%. Now we're replicating those results in, in the Philippines. And in the future, we hope to also do this testing with Macrocystis brown kelps off Tasmania, where we've been working with the University of Tasmania and our, our partners at 2040 and the Intrepid Foundation. And this sounds like a proof of concept. What is needed to get this to market and needed to scale as we're uh, hopefully getting to a lot of uh, investors and entrepreneurs uh, through this podcast? What do you see as the next step to really make this, uh, make this widely available? We'll be moving over the next year from a, a small platform to a hectare scale platform and with the hectare in place, uh, we'll be able to do so much more and really demonstrate the economics of scaling to 100 hectares and more. We're very happy to have the support of Jeremy Grantham and his uh, contributions have enabled us to really develop the marine permaculture up to a hectare scale. So we're looking forward to developing that initially in the Philippines and then showing that it works in temperate latitudes such as Tasmania, uh, once we permit it with the authorities there, and then furthermore to develop it in key countries like Indonesia, where there are more than 2 million seaweed farmers, they grow hectares of seaweed, but they're on the front lines of climate disruption. And the warm layer of water is preventing a lot of the production during the marine heat wave of 2016, over 60% of the yield of the seaweed farms was lost, and over half of the seaweed farms were abandoned on some islands in Indonesia. So we have to help recover that and the subsistence seaweed farmers there in Indonesia. We really need to develop that capability so that the Indonesian farmers can have the climate resilience that's built into the irrigation provided with deep sea water marine permaculture. Yeah, just as a background, Jeremy Grantham is the founder, one of the founders of GMO, which is a big asset manager, which has nothing to do with GMO agriculture, but his foundation has been very active in climate solutions. And I think he committed over a billion dollars recently to the climate change fight. And then secondly, I think it's, uh, so basically you could almost see this as you're partnering with seaweed farmers to enable them to be more climate resistant by basically growing more or up to the, the original level, or maybe beyond of what they were growing, but they already have a market. So that's not a part you have to develop for the seaweed because they, they have offtake but they are being threatened now by climate change and by changing oceans around them, basically. Yes, marine permaculture irrigation is a new product for an existing market. It's over $10 billion industry already in Asia, and we see huge opportunities to develop these technologies further for regions of Europe, including the Mediterranean, including the tropical Atlantic and tropical and subtropical Pacific Oceans. And just to paint a picture, what do you envision in the Mediterranean as it, it seems, not only for Europe, but it seems an enormous hotspot the next decade or decades for climate change for, I heard Morocco is going up five degrees and in terms of refugees, climate change, stress, agriculture, and obviously water. What would you envision that we could do in the next decade? Well, imagine regenerating life in the Mediterranean. We aspire to 
restoring the sardines in Sardinia. We aspire to effectively creating the upwelling that's going to enable the seaweed forest to thrive, the creation of fish habitat, and ultimately this bootstraps the sardines, the forage fish populations, and the game fish, and even the apex predators. We have the opportunity to regenerate life in the oceans. I imagine that you know the sardines might have been named after the island of Sardinia, and uh, wouldn't it be great if we could regenerate those sardine fisheries from, you know, from Israel all the way across to Spain and Portugal? And if you would, let's imagine there's a theater full of active impact investors, people that are enthusiastic about regenic or enthusiastic about marine permaculture. What would you tell them without giving investment advice, obviously, but what would you tell them where to look, what kind of questions to ask if they see things? Because for sure they've been approached by uh, LG companies, seaweed companies, this is the future, uh, left and right, etc. What would you advise them to uh, to look out for, to what kind of questions to ask when getting into this part of the region egg sector? Well, I think there's a key opportunity and that is developing new products for existing industries. And that's one reason we've been doing a lot of work, irrigation and seaweed farms. But beyond that, we're looking at a $350 billion agricultural input market, a $600 billion nutraceutical market, and an $800 billion cosmetics market. And seaweed has a central role to play in all of those. We find time and again, we're supply limited as to how much kelp, how much red seaweed we can actually produce. There's a global shortage of Kappa seaweed, for example, and the prices have doubled over the last uh, year or two. And this is associated with a decreased production associated with higher temperatures in the tropics. So we've got a key opportunity, and that is to regenerate that production enable the industry to get going again and to thrive, and then to further develop these markets as the research is coming out on the nutraceutical side, we can improve the health span, and I would say the cognitive health span of so many people around the world that need to move from a Western diet to something that's much more on the omega-3 side. And keep in mind, these these algae are the original source of um, long chain omega-3 fatty acids. The sardines get it from the algae. So the original source is actually a vegetarian source. So it's uh, you can go directly to the source and skipping the whole fish process in the middle. Well, you can for those. I mean, there's half a half a billion vegetarians in India alone. So imagine vegetarians around the world who can improve their nutrition by a suitable addition of uh, seaweeds from around the world as well and locally. And you mentioned somewhere in, in an interview I, I listened to actually. You're looking for positive outliers. Can you explain a bit of the concept behind that and how do you find them? What kind of framework you have to look for these outliers? Well, I remember after the Vietnam War, there was a serious problem with starvation and children. And I remember that some physicians went to Vietnam and they noticed that a few of the children were not being given more food, but they weren't starving. And they did a lot of interviewing and eventually discovered a positive outlier. And, and there were several, actually. One is that the mothers of these children were giving them four half bowls of rice per day rather than two cups of rice per day. And so the pre more frequent meals and smaller portions were helpful. But they were also grabbing little bits of shrimp and crab that were growing in the rice fields. And they were adding this little bit of protein to the top of the rice. And that tiny bit of addition of protein in minute quantities was sufficient to actually enable muscle building and development and all these other things. And so these tiny little bits of protein had a substantial effect as well. And so these were examples in a medical context and a nutrition context where the, the positive outliers were key. But we also think in terms of ecosystems. The kelp forest is the tropical rainforest of so many countries including Morocco, including California, including Australia. You look to the Brazilian rainforest and the Amazon for being one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. And it's able to fix uh, approximately 2,200 grams of carbon per square meter per year. But what's fascinating to me is that the kelp forests in their natural setting are actually fixing 2,500 grams of carbon, all, in some cases, all the way up to 3,000 grams of carbon per square meter per year. And that means that the actual carbon flux is higher in the kelp forest than it is in the tropical rainforest. Now, some of it gets eaten and respired and returns to the air, but the fact that 
this natural ecosystem is capturing more carbon than the tropical rainforest is really substantial. And the fact that we could find with marine permaculture, substrate and marine permaculture upwelling, we can take this beautiful ecosystem at the edge of the, of the ocean and apply it to the entire uh, 300 kilometers of the exclusive economic zone of so many countries from Morocco to parts of Europe to the Americas and on to Asia. The United Nations talks about small island developing states, SIDS nations. And yet, uh, more recently, people have been calling them big ocean nations because even a small island nation could have several million square kilometers of a big ocean around them. And so this is a huge opportunity for coastal nations around the world to embrace the uh, regeneration of life in the sea, to build the seaweed, rebuild the seaweed forest, regenerate fish habitat, and regenerate the sardine fisheries and the forage fisheries that's 3 billion people on the planet rely upon for their primary source of protein. So it's a big opportunity to really understand how can we use these natural processes to regenerate life on the earth. And I consider really understanding the kelp forest and seaweed ecosystems to be central positive outliers, examples of how nature has done a great job of fixing carbon during the last uh, millennia and millions of years. Wow. Again, so much to unpack, but I, I'd like to ask two questions. One, can you explain a bit how the carbon is, is stored? You mentioned some of obviously is getting eaten, some of it is not being stored permanently, but also some of it is being stored permanently. And then I would like to ask a second question on what's the risk? What's the, uh, the catch, so to, to say, and uh, to stay in, in the theme? It sounds too good to be true. It sounds amazing. What is holding it back? Is it so difficult to build these things at scale because maybe oceans are very rough? What is the, the, the biggest risk or barrier you see? But let's first start with the, the carbon storage. Professor Carlos Duarte has published some papers studying from Cal State University studying how the global seaweed forests export carbon, not locally, but into the middle and deep ocean. Because of course, seaweed drifts and it drifts into the middle and into the deeper ocean and then it sinks. And so very naturally, some 11% or more of the kelp is stored that way. But beyond that, when we actually look to harvesting seaweed at sea, and there's some work in Europe on developing the biorefinery, which will actually provide from the seaweed harvest, um, the sustainable partial harvest, a, um, a bounty of nutraceuticals, high value proteins, polysaccharides, and cellulose and other uh, carbon. This produces a let's say, a cascade of valuable products that come from the seaweed. And whatever the seaweed is not used, let's say we use half of it for food and half of it would be seaweed residues, the uh, leftover seaweed that's not utilized can be sunk into the middle and deep ocean, providing a true blue carbon sink. And that could be well over 11%. You, you might, even most of the seaweed harvest, more than 50% could be residues that would, the seaweed leftovers would be sunk to the middle and deep ocean in a period of perhaps even two days, it would go below a thousand meters. The typical seaweed can drop uh, about 500 meters per day once it's been processed. And so uh, with the bubbles collapsed in the seaweed, it'll sink 500 meters a day. And then in two days, it's below a thousand meters. And our physical oceanographer colleagues have identified that uh, the median time to outcropping for water that's a uh, thousand meters and deeper is 100 to 4,000 years. And so that range provides the basis for developing the United Nations carbon credits where with 100 years as the threshold for developing those. So it presents a distinct opportunity to sink substantial amounts of carbon in it while we're at the same time feeding the world and feeding natural ecosystems. And so what's the risk? What do you see as, as the biggest risk as the interest grows? Obviously, a lot of people just like in, in Region Ag on land are going to jump on this which means cowboys, which means uh, projects and things not done well. It means a lot of pitch decks and a lot of floating numbers that promise a lot of things. What do you see from your experience and being in, being in the space for, for so long and probably have seen and spoken to almost everyone? And what do you see as the biggest risk? Well, in the Americas today and perhaps in Europe as well, there are some regions near shore that occasionally have harmful algal blooms. And if there were harmful algal blooms already occurring, then a marine permaculture upwelling operation could potentially exacerbate those. So we need to monitor for the presence or growth of harmful algal blooms upstream and then uh, monitor downstream as well 
And if there's a situation where there's an exacerbation or some, a problem is getting worse, then the marine permaculture can be turned off. And then that would remove the increase of a harmful algal bloom. So that monitoring for those situations would be important near shore. Further from shore, the incidence of those harmful algal blooms is far lower. So it would be less of a problem. But that's an example where by developing a strong marine permaculture industry association, we'll be able to advise on best practices around the world and ensure that we can develop a strong industry association that commits to best practices and is able to regulate the uh, industry well enough within the association to avoid the need for uh, over over regulation because you know ultimately we need to do well for the planet while we're actually doing uh, well for the economics as well and i'd like to be conscious of your time and end with a number of, of questions which usually uh, take up quite a bit of time so we're, we're hopefully going to finish on time um, what if you could ma- wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up and you've changed one thing in the agriculture or aquaculture, let's say food industry, what would that be? Well, I think we would have the opportunity to work a lot more holistically with our food sources. I think we need to move towards a more vegetarian lifestyle. And that means vegetables on land and vegetables in the sea. And these sea vegetables, there's so many to choose from. I think that's really a key part of this. And as we move towards a somewhat more vegetarian lifestyle with treating, you know, meat becomes a condiment rather than the main course. I think that's an opportunity to really change, you know, the way humans eat. You know, Kofi Annan, as UN Secretary General, said if there's one thing we could possibly do, it would be to eat one vegetarian meal per week. And not because that by itself would make such a big difference, but it would enable people to realize how tasty a vegetarian meal could be. And I think that's a really key because once I've learned how great vegetarian meals could be, I mean, half the meals I eat are vegetarian. I'm not 100% vegetarian, but it's a great way to reduce impact. And I'm reminded of some other sayings. Gandhi, I believe, said, you know, the earth has enough for everyone's need, but not a single person's greed. And if we apply that to a more vegetarian lifestyle, I think that is really significant because we have enough food already to feed 10 billion people on this planet. But if we can simply reduce the intensity of the meat production, then so much of that productivity can go towards feeding the entire planet and having enough food left over for nature to ensure regeneration of those ecosystems. And to stay a bit in the the livestock discussion, actually, you briefly mentioned, and I know there's quite a bit of research now on the methane, obviously, of uh, livestock, of ruminant livestock, and the potential of seaweed there. Can you briefly explain why that is important and how that came about and and where we are, uh, let's say, as a sector? Are we close to feeding it easily to cows or not? What's the story on on the methane, seaweed, and livestock? Yes. First of all, it's, it's important to realize that the methane that we emit each year has a bigger impact on our climate than the CO2 that's being emitted each year. And that's because the methane that's being emitted has a multiplier of 28 or 50 or 70 times the CO2 emission. And so the methane emissions we're doing right now this year has a substantial incremental impact on the climate. And the livestock emissions of methane are one of the largest emissions. And so if we're able to eliminate most of the enteric emissions of ruminant livestock, of methane, that would have a very significant impact on a very significant source of greenhouse gases each year. And so we see this as a big opportunity in the fact that seaweed as an organic feed supplement at a, at a level of 1% to 10% of the, of the feed is able to eliminate most of the enteric emissions of ruminant livestock is extremely significant. It moves us towards more organic feed supplements, and it also moves us towards a more uh, holistic lifestyle. What I love is how the seaweed uh, how is eaten by cows on the beach, naturally, on, of their own accord. Uh, it's eaten by deer in New Zealand. It's uh, hunters have observed deer at night eating seaweed off the beach in, in New Zealand, as an example. And the fact that it's being done naturally by these ruminant livestock to me is very... They're self-medicating. They are. They are. They know just the right amount. We should have seaweed salt licks on pastures around the country, you know, around the world. And, uh, you know, we've got a billion cattle on the planet. 
And you know whether it's the 30 million cattle in uh, in, in Australia or half a billion cattle in uh, in India, you know there's this huge opportunity to ensure that globally we can get the seaweed to these livestock and and enable them to have this more you know this this feed supplement that can be quite healthy for them as well. And just to shift gear, because I, I would like to ask a few questions. What if, and I will explain why I'm asking this question, um, you would wake up tomorrow instead of the magic wand and a vegetarian diet, or let's say the day after tomorrow, and you'll be in charge of a $1 billion investment portfolio. And I'm asking this because I see in the sector a lot of interest coming to region ag, a lot of interest coming to regeneration in general. And I think we should start getting used to larger numbers. Uh, larger numbers of hectares, larger numbers of, of square meters, larger number of acres, and thus also larger uh, amounts of investment capital. And I think as a sector, we need to get ready to absorb uh, these kind of amounts and, and not be uh, frightened by it because of these, these phone calls and these amounts will try to enter the space. And then we need to find a way to put them to work to regenerate as much soil and sea as possible. So that's a bit of background. Um, if you would be in charge the day after tomorrow, where would you start uh, investing? Of course, you can also do partly grant, but let's focus on the ones where you would like to have a financial return. What do you, would you be doing? Well, I'll just provide some example that's close to home. Today in our development, it's cost, we can develop and build marine permacultures at um, for capital costs and parts that are on the order of $10 per square meter. But we have a roadmap to get us below $1 per square meter in the next few years. And as we bring the cost down, of marine permaculture, it becomes less expensive to develop new kelp forest than it is to even buy farmland in Europe or the UK or perhaps even the US. So when you say costs, these are the, the pumps, the equipment, the platform to, to bring up this nutrient dense uh, colder water from below. Correct. And also provide the substrate for the kelp forest and the seaweed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so once this happens, that we get below a dollar per square meter, then we're looking at uh, less than a million dollars per square kilometer to develop these new permaculture facilities and infrastructure. And not only can that permaculture provide a seaweed bounty and fish habitat and ultimately a sustainable yield of fish, but it also cools off the mixed layer of the ocean. And that's enough to actually reverse coral bleaching. And we're looking at the 1,300 kilometers of the Great Barrier Reef and we're currently applying for permits to test a small marine permaculture system that would not only grow seaweed, but would also cool off the reef and protect it from coral bleaching. Imagine if we could spend a billion in infrastructure to protect a $57 billion asset, and that is the Great Barrier Reef. Imagine if we could do that as one of several examples. And Imagine if we could, oh, go ahead. No, and, and I was asking about uh, actually several examples. Let's say you, you were forced by uh, the trustees of the foundation or the bylaws of the investment fund to diversify. Uh, what would be a few others uh, you've seen around or you, you, you see, okay, what other interesting roadmaps to get to those very interesting inflection points like the one you mentioned to get to under a dollar? And uh, what others do you see? Well, I think there's uh, opportunities in regenerative agriculture where we move from our green revolution chemical understanding of the soil with NPK fertilizer and pH to the current generation's biological understanding of soil microbial communities. And this is a place where the prebiotic of seaweed, petri dishes are made out of agar, agar is made out of seaweed. The seaweed is an incredible prebiotic for conditioning the soil to actually facilitate those soil microbial communities. And the regeneration of soil microbial communities is key to carbon farming, where we're able to utilize the biodiversity below the soil, as well as the biodiversity above the soil to regenerate carbon fixation into our soils and potentially fix several gigatons of carbon globally per year into the soils. And I think this carbon farming regenerative agriculture is really key to move towards a deep biological understanding of the soil and how do we plant long roots and how do we facilitate the regeneration of the microbial communities that are responsible for fixing so much carbon and holding onto that carbon for decades in the soils themselves. And my final question, which usually ends up being a few more questions, but what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture, or let's say regenerative food systems in general, that others don't believe to be true? And this question is inspired by John Kempf. We usually ask it about agriculture in general, but I like to ask it about what do you believe to be true about regen ag and food that others don't believe to be true? 
The permaculture design philosophy of adapting nature, I think, is really key. And moving from monospecific crops to silvopasturing, where we have trees and livestock, or multi-layer crops, where we actually planted new crops over old crops, and we've got winter cover crops. This is absolutely essential because, you know, 365 days a year, we want to have a living plant that is actually feeding the microbes in the soil. And so we have to move much more towards biodiversity. We look at partial harvesting of kelp forests as a key opportunity because the kelp supports dozens of species of epiphytes and even thousands of species of invertebrates and fish. And it's actually that interspecies interaction that has a profound effect. I'm reminded that in Hokkaido, Japan, they were harvesting nearly a million tons of herring every year from 1898 and for decades beyond that, until finally in 1953, the herring population collapsed and those herring went extinct. A few decades later, the Saccharina kelp forest also collapsed because it turns out the isotopic studies confirmed that the herring were fertilizing the Saccharina kelp forest, even at the same time that the Saccharina kelp forest was providing the nursery and the egg-laying habitat for the herring. So it's this virtuous cycle of one ecosystem helping the other that we have to regenerate. And it's this understanding of the nutrient value chains and circular value chains in the life cycles of these ecosystems that is essential to our overall understanding. So I think we need to move agriculture more towards multi-species, silvopasturing, intensive silvopasturing as described in Drawdown, and marine permaculture where we're going, yes, we, we harvest maybe one or two species, but we have so many more species living at the same time. And you know the predators are really our friends because they're helping to trim the crop. And so ultimately, the permaculture design philosophy is managing the levels of predators and prey to build a multi-trophic ecosystem. And this integrated multi-trophic aquaculture is just one example, but I think moving towards the permaculture design philosophy is an opportunity in the soils as well as the seas. And what do you believe to be true in this sector? Because this is something that, that at least, not in the broad agriculture sector, but at least in the region X space is, is getting quite known, the multi-species in time and place. Is there something that you believe to be true that others don't in the sector? Well, in our Carbon Farming Innovators Network in the United States, there are probably five measures of soil quality, but they include biodiversity above the ground, as well as biodiversity in the microbes below the ground and other soil organisms. It includes ensuring, well, by increasing this in the soil, we dramatically increase the water retention capacity of the soil. And there are several other measures as well that effectively enable the um, you know, it, it enables water retention in a way that doesn't exist otherwise. We've seen numerous examples in the U.S. and Australia where a suitable biodynamic approach to rebuilding soil enables those soils to absorb five times as much water as a traditional green revolution soil, the compacted soil. And that is a profound effect. I think it's been said that well, it's less about how much water necessarily falls on the soil as to what the soil does with the water. Is it able to absorb the water and how much? And Alan Savory, I think, has pioneered this work in Africa and also in the United States. And he loves to cite to that that when it does rain, we need to be able to absorb that rain. And that means effective soil management. So I think that's another key part of this is to really understand that contrary to traditional wisdom, Silvopasturing involves rotating livestock across a crop in one or two days and then have, giving that, that uh, green pasture, if you will, 30 days to recover. And then it grows even faster than it did before. This is part of the tenets of silvopasturing that move us toward an integrative uh, approach that may include trees and shrubs and some livestock. And I think that achieving that balance at relatively low density is key. The other non-traditional wisdom, I think, is that uh, we have an opportunity to do carbon negative dairy and carbon negative livestock. And I think it's one part seaweed and two parts rotational grazing and soil management. And I think within the next three to five years, we can achieve carbon negative dairy. And yes, we should perhaps have less, um, less meat in our diet and maybe uh, manage the amount of dairy, 
But, you know, in 2030, we're st still going to have meat and dairy. And the thing is, to bring that industry carbon negative would be transformative to the economics and the sustainability of those industries. And it literally is one part seaweed and two parts rotational soil management that can bring us to a carbon negative in many of these critical industries. Yeah, that would be absolutely huge. I, I want to thank you so much, Brian, for your time. I know you're extremely busy uh, these months. You were explaining a bit before the podcast uh, your amount of travel, uh, which is coming up. I will link as much information as possible below and uh, obviously we'll be checking in on uh, the progress of marine permaculture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. It's a pleasure talking with you. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.